Numbers chapter 27. We'll look at Numbers chapter 27. In this passage, Moses had a burden for his people before he can leave them. And he begged the Lord, please send them someone who can be a faithful steward, a faithful leader or a minister so that this congregation can continue on rather than giving them no one to lead or guide them. Don't leave them as sheep having no shepherd. Numbers 27, verse 15. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep, which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight, and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, and all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. The verse really spoke to me as... It shared the same burden with me as I give the cry to the Lord, please leave, uh, do not leave these sheep without a shepherd, someone to lead and to guide them. And God said, you can take Joshua. He's the man you can count on to take the task after you die. He'll be sure to lead the people and get them into the promised land. A little confession that I have to make is that originally I wasn't going to come today uh, because uh, my immune system was very, very weak. So I didn't notice until last Sunday. So last Sunday, I actually had a nosebleed, but I, uh, it was hidden pretty well. So uh, then I realized it wasn't until Thursday that uh, I stressed my immune system. So I had to rest up. And then originally, uh, I was going to have some of the men to teach and preach to you today. But uh, I was praying to the Lord because I don't believe in uh, doing something, especially uh, leaving my sheep without prayer, without the Lord to guide me. Uh, the Lord spoke upon my heart this passage, and I didn't come up with the passage. My wife, she was doing her daily Bible reading, and then she read that passage, actually. And then she was praying to the Lord, Lord, please do not leave the sheep without a shepherd. She didn't mind if uh, I took the day off, but the point was she wanted the sheep to have a shepherd. So she prayed to the Lord. And then I had no idea what she was reading. And then I told her, uh, honey, uh, these people are so hungry. I need to go to church. I'll be fine. I'm going to pray, trust the Lord. If very worst case I can't come, then... I can't come. I'll have my men ready, ready. And then she told me, oh, God answered my prayer. I was like, what? Did I get dragged to church even though I'm tired, beaten to death? <laughs> she said, no, it's uh, just this passage. And she gave it to me. This was the passage she read. The Lord changed my sermon again. So the Lord led upon my heart to preach to you this message. It wasn't planned for. It was uncalled. And I'm going to see how the Lord guides me. What keeps me faithful as a minister for the Lord is to see the people who are sheep without a shepherd, a need. And there's a fire, there's a fellowship, there's a desire to serve God. Some of you are hurting or going through rough times. And when I saw that, I was like, oh God, oh God, I need to get to church and feed your people. Not that I'm the one that's worthy who can feed them because the Lord can use anyone. But that's simply that my heart was stirred that I must be faithful and committed to the people because they are hungry. That's what motivates me as a minister to be faithful to you. But I would like to see how you in return, because you need the sermon, not me. 
That's what you came here today. How you, in return, could be faithful in the ministry. In my case, says Moses, I see the sheep which have no shepherd. You are verse 18. Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun. What does that mean, the son of Nun? A nobody. Nobody, none. And that's what you are. You are Joshua. You're just a nobody. People don't recognize you. They don't applaud you. Everybody knows the pastor, obviously, and the church and everything, but they don't know you. However, you are needed to carry on for the sheep here who have no shepherd. Time and time, the Lord has let go of my hand and show that there are Joshua's who can take care of the sheep who have no shepherd. We need Joshua's because there are sheep here, not just in this room, but in this community who have no shepherd to guide them. In your home who have no shepherd to guide them. They need you. They need someone to give them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Bible-believing truth, and guide them here. What you see in this lost and dying community is sheep who have no shepherd. Oh, does it not stir your heart, my friend? Will you be the Joshua who's faithful and committed? I believe there are lessons we can learn from Joshua before he became a great leader, before he wrote a book of the Bible, before God gave him credit and put him as one of the heroes listed. I believe that there are lessons we can learn from a nobody like Joshua before we knew him as a man who put the walls of Jericho to the ground. I believe there's something we can learn from the life of this nobody named Joshua before he was able to conquer five kings. I believe there's something we can learn from this nobody. For it speaks about you, it talks about you, a simple nobody. But that can become a great Joshua. A faithful servant is necessary for the task. We shall see some nuggets in Joshua's life where you can learn. Let's pray. Father, I am not uh, in the best of mood. I am pushing through my weakness. Uh, for you said that uh, your strength is made perfect in weakness. The words cannot come out as well, but I believe through the guiding of your Holy Spirit, it'll come out the way you want it to come across and to reach these people. May you fill me, Father, cleanse away my sins with your blood, for these are sheep who, uh, who are hungry, Father. Don't leave them, Lord. Don't leave them without a shepherd to give them something to eat. Please, Father, feed your sheep. Lord, you burden my heart to come here today. You've given me the strength to do so. And so I will preach for you again. Will you move amongst your people, Lord? Uh, raise a Joshua, Lord. We need Joshua, not just a Moses. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at Exodus 17, please. Exodus chapter 17. The first mention of Joshua is given right here on his battle and his warfare with Amalek. In his battle and warfare with Amalek. Joshua is first mentioned. He is the one who is to be the fighter. He is holding on to his sword, clinging on to dear life, battling all the enemies and just fighting and fighting. This is what? A nobody. A nobody who is just clinging on to his or her sword for dear life. A nobody just swinging the sword, fighting the enemies. A nobody who doesn't get that much credit. A nobody who's just surviving, literally, while being faithful to the Lord. Just surviving while being faithful to the Lord. In the passage it says, And Moses said unto Joshua, in verse 9, verse 9, Choose us out men and go out fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. 
and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, this passage is famously used where Moses is the leader and he's trying to raise up his hand and his rod. Why? Because whenever he raises up his hands and that rod, the Lord puts some kind of strength upon the armies of Joshua and they're able to conquer Amalek. But Joshua, the leader, gets very tired for the burden and responsibility of a leader can get tiresome. And so he couldn't hold up his hands as long as he wanted to. So he had to drag it down. And when he dragged it down, the strength sapped away from Joshua's soldiers. And then Amalek was winning. And then this passage is famously used. That's why we need an Aaron and a Hur. An Aaron and a Hur who will lift up the leader's hands. The Bible says when Aaron and Hur held up Moses' hands for him that the ministry was able to continue on. The soldiers rallied up, they stirred up energy and fought on for the Lord. And people and preachers would mention out of this passage the need of an Aaron and a Hur to lift up the hands of the preacher because the preacher can get very tired. But I don't want to concentrate on Aaron and Hur's faithfulness right here. It's talking about, jo I want to talk about Joshua, his faithfulness in this passage. I'm going to preach to you, not Aaron and her, lifting up the hands of the preacher because you may not even feel like an Aaron and her. You're truly a Joshua, the son of none. You're not Aaron, Moses' brother. You're not her, the one who was at the right-hand side of Moses and lifted up his hand. No, you are a nobody who's just swinging the sword in the battle. Fighting, surviving, fighting, surviving. Why is Joshua necessary? I think Joshua is necessary right here. Notice right here in this passage, do you realize that, yes, it's true that when Moses and uh, when Aaron and Hur were not there by Moses' side, you notice, right, Moses lifted up his hands down, right? But did it say he let go? It never said he let go of the rod. It just said he lowered why? Because Joshua was still there yeah. fighting. And Moses, when he was getting tired, yes, Aaron and her lifting up his hands, man, helped rally up the church and the group and they were able to fight on. Yeah, Moses, I'm sure was happy for an Aaron and her, but I'm pretty sure he was very grateful for a Joshua when Aaron and her weren't there to lift up his hands. When the time when the preacher has no Aaron and her to lift up the hands. The time when the preacher lowers the rod and says, I'm so tired, Father. But he's clinging on to dear life, onto the rod, leading the people, even at the preacher's weakness, even at the preacher's fault and the preacher's imperfection. When his stamina and energy lowers, Joshua never dropped the sword. And because Joshua clave onto the sword, and yes, even though the whole church was losing and Amalek was winning, Joshua still clave onto the sword. And that's why Moses clave onto the rod. My friend, when the man of God and when God calls and ordains a preacher to lift up a ministry and he lifts up his hand and the rod gets tiresome and he lowers it and he says, oh God, I'm just so tired, Father. I'm just so tired. But guess what? That preacher can't let go because he sees Joshua over there. And because Joshua is fighting against the enemy, that's why the preacher says, I cannot let go of the rod. I'll cling on to it. Even if I'm falling, even if I'm being weak, I will hold on to the ministry, still lead, and faithfully commit to your people. And oh to God, we need not just Aaron and hers, but during, during the preacher's weakness, during the preacher's lowering of the rod, we need Joshua's who will cling on to the sword. We need people who would fight the battle, just keep fighting and fighting the battle, even if they're losing, 
even if Amalek is winning, even when the preacher is losing, even when the preacher is getting down, we need Joshua's to take up the sword and keep fighting on for God. Because you never know, Joshua, behind the scenes where you're not watching because all you're seeing is blood, all you're seeing is struggle and fight. You have your fight, you have your war, and you're so busy getting involved in the church, helping out people, and you're fighting the battle of the Lord. You have no idea that Moses is behind the scenes, that preacher is behind the scenes in discouragement, in weakness, lowering the rod. You have no idea what's going on over there. The preacher, in his weakness, in his lowering, you know what we need? The Joshua's who are faithful, who will still hold on to the sword and fight. Why? Because it makes the preacher behind the scenes where you don't see during his time of discouragement, he observes the Joshua's. He sees the Joshua's fighting. He sees the Joshua's praying. He sees the Joshua's overcoming battles. He sees the Joshua's conquering their enemies. He sees the Joshua's soul winning. He sees the Joshua's coming to church. He sees the Joshua's getting involved in so much work into the church that the preacher just can't let go even though he's dropping. We need the Joshua's. That's why you need to be faithful, Joshua. Why? Because you don't know that preacher if he's lowering the rod. That's why you need to be committed, Joshua. Because you don't know if the preacher is about to drop the rod. You don't know, Joshua, that preacher is clinging on to that rod because you're still fighting and clinging on to your sword. That's why you need to be faithful, Joshua. Well, the church is getting weak. People aren't coming to church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray for, don't come anymore. I'm getting discouraged. So much battles I'm fighting in my life. My friend, that's why it's so important you cling on to the sword because your preacher, your leader is also becoming weaker. But that doesn't mean the battle is lost. It, it loses, it's lost when Moses dropped the rod. What if Joshua said, the, we're losing the battle. Our leader is getting weaker and dropped the sword and ran away. Amalek would have won. You know why Joshua won? He held onto the sword even though he was losing and his own leader was losing. That's why they won. You know why Satan can't destroy this church? There's some Joshua who's clinging onto the sword even though Moses Hands are getting heavy and there's no Aaron and her to lift it up. But Aaron and her will come. But there comes a time when Aaron and her are not there. Who will be the one to swing the sword? Exodus 24. Exodus 24. That's one thing we notice about Joshua's faithfulness. Even though he's losing in the battle, he's still fighting because... He doesn't realize that the leader is about to drop and his action saved his life. His action rescued the people. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Exodus 17, we won't go back there, but the Bible says that Joshua won against Amalek. And God told Moses, say to Joshua. Why? God never forgot Joshua's faithfulness. The son of none, nobody. Everyone looks at Aaron and her. Aaron and her who held up the hands of Moses. But God saw Joshua. Yes, yes. He didn't speak to Aaron and her in this passage. We need Joshua's. We need Joshua's. Too many people want to be an Aaron and her. No, you're, you're the son of none. You're just a nobody who's Amen. holding on to a sword surviving every day, just swinging it left and right, fighting for the Lord, just fighting on for dear life. Exodus chapter 24. We'll look at verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. 
And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up to me into the mount and be there. So notice right here that the 70 elders of Israel, they get to see the glory of God. Did you see that? Man, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, imagine seeing God. He didn't show them all of his face, but he showed them a bit of his look. Man, you ever been on the mountaintop just like those 70 elders and you may not have seen God completely face to face, but you got a little glimpse of him and you felt like heaven and you're off at a summer camp or a blowout or a revival meeting and you got a little taste of heaven and glory and you're like, woo, glory to God and keeps you being faithful for the Lord. Amen. Keeps you being faithful for the Lord. Yeah. Joshua missed out. Joshua wasn't there. Look at verse 13. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. Now notice right here, Joshua missed out verse 9 through 11. He gets, he misses out the glory of the Lord, the mountaintop experience. And then Moses says, okay, Joshua, your turn. Let's go to the mount. Yeah, glory to God. I'm going to see God, the glory of the Lord. But he doesn't. The Bible never mentions he does. Just goes over there to minister. Why? Because I'm not the Aaron and her. Did you read that passage at verse 14? Aaron and her are the ones in charge. They get some privilege. Joshua, he's the son of none. He's a nobody. Nobody. Who is Joshua? The one who get the walls of Jericho to come down. We're not there yet. The one who conquered five kings. We're not there yet. Who is Joshua? Just the son of nobody. And he ministered to Moses. He stayed faithful, even though he didn't see the glory of the Lord. Okay. You know, you see Aaron and hers out there who are lifting up the preacher's hand, and then you feel like, oh man, I want to get involved in something like that. And you hear about people where they had the touch of God or this experience, a mountaintop experience. And haven't you been through times where you missed out. Yes. Yes. And you weren't there when God was present. You weren't there when God spoke to the person. You hear testimonies of these people who talk about how God ministered, provided a miracle, answered the prayer request. But you're the son of none. You get none of that. Yes. Okay. You see no glory of the Lord. You see no miracle in your life. You miss the mountaintop experience. It's so easy to be faithful and serve God when you're hyped up after a revival meeting. But it's hard to be and it's hard to be faithful to God when you miss out on that. But Joshua was still faithful. Yes, yes. Even though he missed out the glory. That's good. Even though he wasn't there to witness the glory. Can I tell you something else too? Aaron and her who lifted up Moses' hands. Aaron, who saw God's presence, you thought they'd be faithful after their glory land revival meeting. Well, they do after that. They worship a golden calf. Yeah. After seeing God, how can you be so stupid to worship a golden calf after that? Yeah. You know why? It's easy to be faithful when you witness the glory of God, but when that glory is gone... Let's see you be faithful. Let's see you worship a golden calf. Let's see you be as stupid as those Jews who worship a golden calf after they saw the glory of God. Let's see you be faithful. Joshua wasn't stupid. He didn't get to see a blowout. He didn't get to see a revival meeting. He didn't need the weekend revival to keep him going. He didn't need the glory of the Lord or the answer prayer or the miracle. He was just faithful. Like Triple amen. 
Every time after a glorious meeting with the Lord, you have to go back to your golden calf? Wow. Are you Joshua who don't get to witness the glory of God, but stay faithful? Stay faithful. You might say, why would Joshua be able to stay faithful? Because in verse 13, it says, not, notice what Joshua is called, a minister, right? Do you see that in verse 13? Yeah. Okay, does that sound as powerful as verse 9, elder? Look at verse 9. Elders get to see the glory of God, but not a minister. Why? A minister means a waiter, yeah. a person who serves tables. Right. Joshua wasn't like, I need a revival meeting. I need a glory land experience. I need the touch of God. I need the miracle. I need to see an answer to prayer. No, no, no. Joshua wasn't like that. He realized all I am is a minister. I'm not an elder. Right. Right. I don't deserve what I have. Yes. You're not I'm just a minister, yeah. meaning I'm just a servant. Right. Like this. That's why he was faithful. That's why. He didn't expect a glory land experience all the time. He just expected to serve. Amen. Do you see yourself like that? You need pastor here to give you a glory land experience all the time? Five, Every Sunday? You need the brethren to always give you a glory land experience all the time? You need testimonies? You need blowout? You need singing? You always need the glory of God to keep you being faithful? Preach! 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 Or do you realize, I don't deserve all of that. If I miss out, I miss out. It's a wonderful thing those people were able to enjoy the glory of God. Amen. It's a wonderful thing they did. All I am is just a servant. It's good. I just serve. Go to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. He was faithful without a revival meeting. He was faithful without stamina and encouragement from brethren. He was faithful without God and showing his glory. He was faithful. How about you? Amen. How about you? You're not in glory mode right now. You know that? You're not on the mountaintop experience right now. Good. Your opportunity to be a servant. Your opportunity to prove your worth, to be faithful. Exodus 32. Notice the Bible reads here <coughs> at verse 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. So Joshua Remember from the previous passage, he was waiting for Moses, right? So then Moses finally meets him. Already the Jews are worshiping a golden calf and there's a noise going on. Joshua never leaves his territory to go down and see what's going on with the Jews. Never. He doesn't do that. He sticks to his post. He sticks to his position and duty. How long? Go back to Exodus 17. Uh, 24, excuse me. Go back to Exodus 24. How long? <coughs> Verse 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. You know what Joshua was doing? Swinging the sword, killing the Malachites. No. Helping out Moses when he went up the mount. No. Moses was alone with God in Mount Sinai. Jo Joshua was stuck in the middle of the mount somewhere. Moses had to be alone with God. And Joshua had to wait. That's good. He had to wait. He couldn't even serve tables. He just sat there doing nothing. Wait. That's good. Wait. You know what faithful people do? They wait. wait. No, I need to swing the sword at least. Cut some head off. 
battle for the Lord. So winning and fight on for the Lord. No, no, no. You wait. Wait. Well, at least I can minister. That's a servant, right? Serve tables. Wash their feet. No. Wait. Wait. You know what the problem with people nowadays is? They think they're faithful to God's work when they do something. They have to do something. What can I do? What can I do? No, just do the same thing you're doing. And just wait. Well, that ain't helping out. I just, I need to help out Moses. I need to help out Moses. No, Moses needs to be alone with God. Spend one-on-one time. And I know you want to help out Moses. And Moses needs all the help that he can get. But God says, no, Moses, just me and you. Joshua, sit there. How long, Lord? I ain't telling you. Sit there. Wow. Joshua didn't know it was 40 days, 40 nights. The Jews, they were worried. They got scared. They were like, Moses died. But Joshua stuck to his post. Can you imagine? Probably in his mind, he's thinking Moses died. I wonder what happened. What's, what's going on? Joshua still stuck to his post. Isn't it interesting that the Bible says in Exodus 24, when you read that passage again, the Bible says his minister, Joshua. Joshua, how can he minister to Moses? All he did was sit up there and wait 40 days, 40 nights. How can he minister to Moses? You can minister to the preacher by simply doing nothing and waiting. I ain't helping out Moses. Moses needs that. I need to do something to help out Moses. Moses says, no, you need to just sit there and wait. You're helping me out by doing that. Amen. 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 Didn't you know you're faithful by just sitting still at the feet of Jesus, Mary, rather than doing something, Martha? You're being faithful. I know you want to spiritually grow. I know you want to accomplish more things for the Lord. And I know you want to get busy and get more active. And it discourages you when you see your brethren who are making leaps and bounds and you're still, in, you're still falling behind. But guess what? You are in the right place to be where God says, wait. wait. You are ministering to God's people that way. Wait. You want to be faithful? Then you need to wait. Joshua, you think he's a waiter after cutting off people's heads? So much into action, 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 war, conquering enemies. Yeah. It's got to get to him to yeah. sit still right. without God telling him how long it would take. Okay. And some of you get jittery just after a couple weeks. You can't do 40 days. God just wants you to sit still. Amen. You want to be faithful, Joshua? Time to stop cutting off heads. Put the sword in the scabbard and wait until God gives you the next command. Well, that's good. Amen. Amen. You want to be faithful, Joshua? Learn to wait. Amen. Go to Exodus chapter 33 again. Excuse me, uh, chapter 32, chapter 32 again. If Joshua did not wait, what would he have done? You ever thought of that? What would he have done? At verse 17, he thought it was war going on at the camp. Joshua, he would have left his post that God told him to wait and to stick to. Joshua left, would have left his post out of fear. Those Jews are getting slaughtered by the enemy. I need to go over there and do something. But no, Joshua didn't do that. Even though he thought, it's war. They're dying right there. I need to go down there and help them. Thank God he didn't. Yes. What if he went down there? Maybe he would have been swung by the crowd to worship the golden calf. Maybe they would have imprisoned him or killed him for opposing them. It was a good move that he waited. Yeah. If he went and done something... It would have harmed him. Right. Right. Hey, Joshua, I know your perception is there's a noise of war going on in the church and they're dying and I need to go down there and do something. Better yet, no, you leave them alone to God. Amen. Well, that's good. 
God had no hesitation. They're worshiping a golden calf. God didn't care. You shouldn't care either. You should entrust them to the Lord. And I know you feel like you have to get involved in every single detail and thing. But my friend, if you do that, you are going to get harmed yourself. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Because your perception is like Joshua. They're dying. They need help. And God's like, no, they're not. They're okay. They're just caught up by the ways of the world. You need to sit still and wait. If you get out, if you leave your post, you're going to hurt yourself. That's why you should wait. Go to Exodus 33. Exodus chapter 33. The Bible says in verse 5, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which was without the camp. Now notice right here in verse 10, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. What happened was, after they worshipped the golden calf, they were in trouble. So Moses said, God's angry at you. You're a stiff-necked people. I'm going to go to the tabernacle and intercede with God on your behalf. And those Jews, they cleaned up all their pagan stuff. And then they saw Moses going inside the tabernacle. And what they did was they stood in front of their tent door and then they worshiped the Lord. Sounds like a noble, noble thing, right? Sounds like a great thing. Finally, these members are getting right. Finally, they're being faithful to the Lord. They're returning. I find something interesting right here. If we look at verse 11... And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, there you are again, Josh, the son of Nun, a young man, what does it say? Departed not out of the tabernacle. Joshua, instead of being in front of his tent and worshiping the Lord, he got away from his tent went to the tabernacle where Moses was talking with God. You know, if I were those Jews after worshiping a golden calf, I wouldn't just clean up my stuff and stand in front of the tent door and worship God. I'd follow Joshua and go like this and, and plead with God. Go closer to God's side in the tabernacle. It's amazing. These Jews, in spite of all their wickedness, all they could do is in front of the tent flap even with God's judgment and anger, his anger on them, they still, they still would not go beyond the tent door. They can't go inside the tabernacle with God. I don't know what you got in your own tent, my friend. Okay, okay. But is it important enough where you can leave your tent and go to God's tabernacle? Okay. I know you worship God. I know you got your own things in your tent. You got work, you got family, you got a schedule. You got everything important. You got your own plans. You can't come to church because of a planned vacation or something. Look, I get all that. But are you like Joshua who says, I can leave my tent and go inside the tabernacle to serve God all the way? You think that God is pleased when you clean up all your pagan idolatry, you get right with God, and then you just worship the Lord from your tent. When's the last time you got out of your tent? huh? When's the last time you got out of your tent and said, okay, God, me and you, I'm faithful to you. No tent behind me, Father. No turning back. Forsook all to follow thee. But schedule, 
your own plans, your goals, your tent always keeps you back from worshiping the Lord at the tabernacle. You just worship him afar off. Every time you sing a hymn here, every time you come to church today, and even when you try to go close to God on the altar, you're still at your tent flap. Ooh, that's good. Come on, Joshua. Where's Joshua where he's able to go into the tabernacle? Leave his tent. Wow. You want to be faithful to the Lord? You got to leave your tent. I can worship God from my tent. Yeah, so can the Jews. But you're not like Joshua. The Bible notes that about Joshua. You know what that verse says? It's, it's not just Joshua. It said in verse 7, and it came to pass that who? Just Joshua? Just Moses or what? Everyone. Everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Anyone, everyone can do it. But they didn't. They just stood in front of their tent door, cleaned up their sin and worshiped the Lord. I'm right with God. And come home Monday, they're just the same because that tent always keeps them behind. What's in your tent? When are you going to leave your tent, Joshua? Go to Numbers 26. Numbers 26. You want to be faithful? I know, everyone has plans. Same here. If you're talking, you want to talk to one of the busiest guys, it's me. I get that. I'm so bound by things. But God had to change my plans, shatter my plans, take away my plans, so that I can finally leave my tent I had to let go of my tent and just be me and God. Yeah. You know what this sermon is? I had to leave my tent in the back file. I am not going to bring my tent here to you for Sunday main service and preach off of a tent. Praise the Lord. God changed my plan, like I told you, with a totally different message. I want me and God. Yeah. And I told God that. Yeah, you know what you're seeing? Not my tent. The tabernacle. Look at Numbers 26. Numbers 26. Look at verse 63. These are they that were numbered by Moses and Eliezer the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. But among these there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. They wandered the wilderness for 40 years, the Jews. Now, 40 is a number representing trial, temptation, testing. So you can imagine Joshua and Caleb, they went through a lot of trying and testing in those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. What you'll notice is that everyone died save, save Caleb and Joshua. You know, Joshua and Caleb, they stayed faithful to Moses in spite of 40 years of problems, 40 years of trials, 40 years of suffering. They stuck faithful to Moses and because of that, the Lord blessed them. Amen. Can I tell you that uh, while you're faithfully serving God, you'll have problems as well? Yes. While, while, while serving God, while being faithful, yes. you got problems to juggle and handle. Yes. That's true. But you don't let the problems and the trials divert you away from your faithfulness. You say, I cannot let... 40 years of wandering the wilderness, that suffering, get to me. I got my priorities, my duties for the Lord. I'm going to commit and stick to them. Amen. Joshua and Caleb did that, in spite of the problems that they went through. But every time we go through problems, that's our reason why we neglect our duty for the Lord. We skip our duty for the Lord. Right. Not Joshua and Caleb. Everyone can go to problems but are you faithful 
to stick to the duty and task in spite of problems? Problems, if they are always your legitimate excuse to not be faithful in that task, the devil will keep sending you problems. And where you think that, let me get the problem behind me, then I'll faithfully commit and get back to that one, the devil will send you a new trial and suffering. There's always problems. The question is, are you faithful during the problems? Are you faithful in spite of the problems? Or do the problems control you? Do problems control your life? Everyone has their emotional distress, their depressing moments, their own problems, something that hurts them deep down inside. But let me tell you something, my friend, is no faithful servant can get to serving God without a hard time. Yeah, that's true. None. None. They all bear that while serving the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know what's going on in our minds, but then I'm going to die. I'm not going to survive. You're pushing me to do something. Oh, don't push me. You can't have me do that. My friend, are you trying to save yourself? You're trying to save your own well-being your own stress level, and you're saying, oh, I can't do that work of the Lord because I have to, what, save yourself on this and this and this? The verse didn't say Caleb and Joshua saved themselves. You know what? Who saved them at verse 65? The Lord. It says, for the Lord had said of them, verse 65. It says, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. They got saved not because they saved themselves, not because they took care of their health, and not because of, oh, you know, I took care of my problems first and I prioritized my problems. And No, 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 no. God saved them. You know what you'll find out when you're faithfully serving God in spite of problems trying to get a control over you? If you refuse the problems to control your life and you stay faithful to the Lord, you're going to soon find out you're still alive had it not been the grace and mercy of God. Rather than your own plans, your own management skills, and your way of handling stress levels. Knock all that out and be faithful and serve God Almighty because he's the only one that will save you and pull you like a pluck, a brand plucked out of the fire. That's literally God. He saves you. Amen. 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 If you put yourself into it and say, no, no, I got to look at my stress level, time management and all these things and these problems I got to take care of. Oh, I'm so discouraged. I can't go to church. Don't push me and stuff like that. You're trying to save yourself rather than letting the Lord save you. I became a pastor. I can only get the walls of Jericho to fall down because of my wilderness back then. And I had to drive through five hours of Los Angeles traffic, taking care of a small church that now closed down. It wasn't going to become fruitful. And the Lord knew that, but he put me in a wilderness to test and try me. Let's see if you're faithful. Joshua, the son of no one. I wasn't Gene Kim with this ministry. I was the son of none. The son of none. Just being faithful. No matter how many problems I went through and I felt like dying and I felt like throwing up and I felt like I would lose it all, God pulled me out of the fire every single time. And he still does it today. You know why you don't see any miracles in your life of God pulling you out of the fire? You never let him. You never let him. You always put yourself away from the fire, running away from the fire. That's why you don't see God's mighty work pulling you through the fire. Again, Numbers 14. Numbers 14 and Numbers 27. Numbers 14, Numbers 27. I do not give a testimony of my life to tell you that I'm better than you because I am not. I only give my testimony with such conviction because I know what it's like to literally have problems and you're juggling everything and you need to have faith and let go and let God. 
and let God save you, not yourself. If there's one thing my ministry should prove with all these fruits is literally a guy who's a nobody who clung on to dear life except God's grace. That's the fruits and the power of this ministry. Not, not this person, but all God. Gene Kim can't save himself a lick. Gene Kim would have killed himself so many times over for his fouled up dumb mistakes. Gene Kim can't save himself. I need God. You think you'll do a good job saving yourself? You might kill yourself one day if you're not careful. Wow. Look at Numbers 14. And then notice right here. Now this is probably the famous passage out of everything that proved Joshua's faithfulness and commitment to the Lord and to the work. Verse 6, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Verse 10, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. For some of you who don't know the story, all the Jews, all the church, all the congregation turned against Moses, except Joshua and Caleb. They stood faithful. Because of their faithfulness, God said, I'm going to wipe out all this older generation in the congregation, but I'll spare only Joshua and Caleb because they were faithful while the rest were not. How can Joshua be so faithful? I find something interesting what the Lord said. Because God said this. Look at the same chapter and look at verse 24. This is what God said in verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because what? He had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereinto he went and his seed shall possess it. Why? Because the spirit of the whole congregation was very bad. It was discouragement, bitterness, fear. But God said Caleb had a different spirit. Go to Numbers 27. Numbers 27. That Joshua too, he had the spirit. Look at Joshua. Uh, Numbers 27, excuse me. Numbers 27, verse 18. Numbers 27, 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the what? Spirit. In whom is the spirit. Joshua had another spirit too. Now I'm going to show you something, something pretty eye-opening here, which is amazing about our Lord. If you uh, know your passage, the Lord, he put a spirit upon the people and they were able to be filled with the spirit and they were able to prophesy. Uh, you're going to look at Numbers 11. Look at Numbers 11. Numbers 11. Numbers 11. Numbers chapter 11. And then we'll read verse 24. Numbers 11 verse 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto, <laughs> unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets? and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Now let me connect all these three passages together. You notice right here, God put his spirit and his power 
on the 70 elders at verse 25, right? Now, Joshua would be okay with that because, hey, they're elders. They saw the glory of the Lord at Mount Sinai. I'm used to that. But what got to his goat was verse 26. Not elders, just two nobodies in the camp. Eldad and Medad. And God's spirit was on them. Joshua, he did not like that. It got to him. As a matter of fact, he was jealous because of verse 29. Moses said unto him, envious thou for my sake. Why would Joshua be jealous for Moses' sake? You know, Joshua, in verse 28, he's telling Moses to forbid them from prophesying. Why? Because, verse 26, they did something abnormal. Eldad and Medad prophesied in the camp, not in the tabernacle with the 70 elders. So when Joshua, here he is strictly obeying orders. He's not being a show-off. He's not trying to be a spiritual guy. He's being humble, being faithful to the Lord. Let the 70 elders be filled with the Spirit of God. Let the Lord mightily use them in the tabernacle. But then he sees these two guys in the church all of a sudden claiming they have God's spirit power and prophesying, that gets to Joshua. He's saying, you're out of line. You got to be here with me. But Moses exposed to Joshua, you're being envious for my sake, pretending to be my side because they were out of bounds. It should be only in the tabernacle with the 70 elders. You're doing it for my sake, but you got envy in you. You know what the problem with faithfulness is? Faithfulness makes us set up our own standards of spirituality and humility. That when we see God, the Holy Spirit, using somebody else, and it doesn't follow our way of faithfully serving God, we get judgmental and we say, no, you should stop. God's not in you. Why? Because they're not like you? You know what the problem with a lot of Bible believers today is? This is their problem. They got false humility. They, because the Holy Spirit is using somebody else so mightily and not them, they assume you're out of line. You're out of bounds with God. Why aren't you humble like yeah. me? Yeah. Serving yeah. God in the closet like me. Amen. Praying with much holiness like me. Amen. If, you're not prop, if you're not careful, Joshua, unconsciously you're having jealousy. Because God used them mightily on something that you never got. Leave them alone. Why does the Holy Spirit use them? I don't know. There are plenty of people that I don't like either. And I mean Bible believers too. But God mightily uses them. His Spirit falls on them. Isn't it easy for me to get on them and judge them and say, you're not my, like me in faithfulness, service, and stuff like that? And that's jealousy. And the devil will get you that way. Because God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't use everybody's service like yours, fella. You think that the whole world revolves around you, that God blesses your faithful service, so everybody has to be like you. Oh, you Bible-believing, King James-only, dispensational, right doctrine you. Who do you think you are, Mr. Humble? Be careful, Joshua. And I know it gets to you that the Holy Spirit's using them on something. And by the way, let me say this. This is before Numbers 14. You know what God said in Numbers 14? Everyone dies, the older generation. That includes Eldad and Medad. The one where the Holy Spirit fell on them and God was mightily using them. But God said they die. Except... Joshua and Caleb. Amen. Amen. Why? Joshua's probably thinking, I never had the Spirit in me, mightily using me. But Numbers, you read it. What did the Bible say? Joshua had the Spirit. Did you read that? Go back to that verse if you don't believe me. Go to Numbers 27 again. Did you read that? Did you read that? Numbers 27, verse 18. What did God say about Joshua? 27, 18. God said to Moses, you're going to have Joshua take your place. That's a high honor and call. Joshua, who never got to witness the glory of the Lord. Joshua, who was not part of the 70 elders. 
Joshua, who didn't get to raise Moses' hands like Aaron and her. Joshua, who is the son of Nun. God said, I want him. Why? Because the Bible says in verse 18, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the what? Like Caleb. He had another spirit, the Bible said. Joshua and Caleb had the spirit. But Eldad and Medad had the spirit. They were prophesying. You know what the problem with servants are nowadays? Why they're not faithful? They keep looking at the manifestation of the spirit rather than the actual Holy Spirit in them to begin wow. with. And they think that a person is so spirit-filled because the Holy Spirit manifested out of Eldad and Medad. Man, look at that. So many souls saved from that person. Look at that. A preaching that convicted and moved the heart. Look at that. God's Holy Spirit is in that person. You, you're all sight. Sight. That's the problem with us stupid human beings. We need to see something for God to Holy Spirit fill and use. And you have no idea that the Holy Spirit was in that person all that time. That's why Joshua was faithful. Not because of the manifestation of the Spirit like Eldad and Medad. They got killed in the wilderness. You know what the difference of the manifestation of the Spirit is with the actual Spirit in you? All right? The Bible says, walk in the Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Pastor Noel said this one time before. You can see the Holy Spirit fill somebody and use somebody and preach a great sermon and God mightily using them, and they could be just as sinful and fleshly and backslidden. Yes, that's true. Didn't Samson get filled with the Spirit of the Lord when yes. he had yes. the strength and yes. conquered his enemies? Yes. But he was just a fornicating bum. Yes. You're looking at the manifestation of the Spirit. Ooh, Gene Kim, subscribers and the views and all the people, the blowout and the degrees and all that. Yes. My friend, that's not what you got to be looking at. Not how the Spirit manifests, but really that the Spirit is in that person. That's right. Yes, that's right. How can I know? If you have the Holy Spirit inside you, you know. If you both walk, if you and me walk in the Holy Spirit, we know. That's how you're faithful is you're in the Spirit. You always had the Spirit to begin with. How do I know they have the Spirit? Well, isn't it simple? You're saved, so you have the Spirit. Two, the verse said you have to walk in the Spirit. Joshua never lost his walk with God. Amen. His spirit was so plain because when the congregation had a spirit of discouragement, it's easy to see the Holy Spirit working. Yes. The Holy Spirit don't have to do a flashly, uh, flashy manifestation. Right. You'll catch the Spirit. Yep. In this godless, wicked world, People can know if you have the Spirit or not. But in your workplace, in your school, in your everyday living, and even in this church, sadly, people just see you the same as them. God said about Caleb, he didn't have the same thing like the congregation. He had another spirit. You want to be faithful to God? Do you have another spirit? that's distinguished from the congregation without any flashy show or manifestation that you got it, bud. You can preach a great sermon. You still ain't got it, bud. Can people can tell, I know that person has the Holy Spirit. That's a faithful person. Every head bow and every eye shut.